<laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Robin Perchia. I am the director of EdenKeeper.org. We are a site that explores the connection between uh, spirituality and environmentalism. And we are so excited to have Amy Livingstone of Sacred Art Studios in Portland joining us today. Uh, Amy is a visual artist, she's an earth advocate, um, and she is a spiritual guide. And today she is going to help us explore the relationship that we can have uh, with the environment <clears throat> through art. So just as a couple of disclaimers before we start, or points of interest, um, please use the chat box on the right side of the screen if you have any questions as we go along. And also, please excuse us for any kind of technical errors we might have. This is only our second webinar. So with no further ado, here's Amy. Amy, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Robin. Thank you all for joining us today. I feel really honored to be here. Thank you. So Amy, a lot of the people who are watching are concerned about the environment. Uh, we're watching the landscape change around us, forests disappear, the climate change. Uh, let's start with a big question first. What is the role that art can play as we're looking at this changing world? Well, for me it's a very important question as an artist. Um, certainly when we look throughout history, uh, the history of humankind, um, human beings and artists have been giving an expression you know, to the world around them. Um, so it's always been part of our history of this expression, right? And then um, if we look at spiritual art or religious art um, and human beings wanting to give expression to their experience of God, the divine, so from far as back, far back as Lascaux, the caves in Lascaux, or uh, the goddess figurines from the Neolithic period, up into the modern day, um, these beautiful mosques and temples and whatnot. So human beings have always been creating art and trying to find meaning about our existence through art. So if we look at that and also the role of the art artist to also create new forms of um, um, artworks through different mediums to give us a new view of reality. So if we think back even to the Impressionists, for example, who were quite radical in their day, they helped us see the natural world in a completely new way with light and color. And so as we go through history, we see that uh, the pop artists of the 60s, remember Warhol with the soup cans. So there's always there's this long history throughout human, uh, our human evolution of art and the important role it plays in our world and in our lives and how we see the world. So I kind of just wanted to share that just as kind of a, you know, framework to start the conversation because I believe in hugely in the importance of art and its role in our world and in our culture and shaping culture. So if we look at that um, and then we come to modern day, right? So nowadays, here we are, you know, 2014, we're facing multiple crises on all fronts, as you were already saying, um, you know, the ecological crisis, species extinction, economic inequality, it's just, it becomes very overwhelming. Um, our world, there's lots changing. So what is the role right now facing all these various crises? And um, for me, I, I believe that on some fundamental level, all of us human beings, um, we know intellectually this is happening. We're getting bombarded daily with statistics, uh, with, you know, from the internet, on the web, I mean, media, news, everything. So. For me, I feel like that art right now has a role of taking all this information from our heart, from our head to our heart. So when we um, look at some contemporary artists who are doing this right now, someone, I just saw a new video about the Washed Ashore Project. I don't know if some of you are familiar with that. It's an amazing, uh, this artist on the coast who takes all this plastic that's washed up on the Oregon coast and make these large sea creatures. And when you see these these pieces live, they just they break open our hearts. Really, I mean, they're beautiful, but then you see that they're from plastics in the ocean. So, it has a way. The art has a way to break open our hearts to not only the beauty of our world, but also what's happening, and then hopefully, you know, it's in, to inspire action. Um, the 
the other piece too right now there's all there are also visionary visionary artists and uh, as I am also creating artworks that illustrate through a visual medium our interconnectedness in the web of life so I believe deeply that we this consciousness around this interdependence that we have with the earth and all living creatures and is an essential part of um, going forward in our world at this time. Hmm. So I guess art can play a lot of different roles uh, in this changing world. Yeah. Um, tell us a little bit about how you got to where you are right now because um, yeah, I've known, I know that you, you play a lot of different roles, you know, visual artist, earth advocate, spiritual guide. Mm -hmm. How did you make that connection um, with uh, the changing environment in your heart and able to produce art through that. Yeah. Well, it's been a long journey getting here, I would say, but um, I think just in you know, in general, as most children do, I was connected to the earth, uh, to nature, and um, but I was growing up in New England, um, and so I was drawing at that time. But it was really when I moved to Florida as a teenager. And I started, and this, I'm kind of getting to the story, but just kind of setting up the idea, you know, the kind of my the history I had with my relationship to the earth and, um, and how that, you know, that journey. But, um, so I was living, I moved to Florida as a teenager. My parents moved there. And it was there that I really became very connected to the water and the landscape there. And so some of my early paintings, like you'll see here, the egret that I painted, I was, you know, in my early 20s in college. And, um... So I had this really beautiful connection with the the natural landscape there in Florida. Started doing, uh, getting into painting flowers and things like that. So my connection with the natural world and the inspiration that I had from nature was already present there. Um, so I was inspired by not only the beauty of our world. But there was times when my artwork became a process of healing, and um, I believe that um, art is a healing practice as well as a spiritual practice. And so, one of my early paintings <laughs> was this painting of a heart inside a web. Um, so, it was inspired by a breakup of a relationship. Um, and so I was inspired also by the Surrealists at the time, Dolly and Magritte and things like that. So, so by this time, my work is inspired by the natural world. It also is a medium for me to express and give um, expression to my pain for the world. But I would say it was really this significant turning point that actually led me to this journey it was when I was 29 years old. Um, this was when my brother died from AIDS and my mother died suddenly nine months later. So by the time I was 30, um, I was in a very deep place of a darkness, what John of the Cross called uh, the dark night of the soul. I didn't know it at the time. I was just in a very dark, um, grieving period. And um, this painting that you'll see um, was one of the first paintings that I started and created in that place of darkness. Um, I hadn't been painting for several years um, while I was pursuing a graphic design career, but um, I think one night um, I always had a canvas up on my uh, easel in my apartments where I was living, and so one night I came home probably drinking too much wine, you know, as self-destructive behavior, and uh, I started painting this canvas, and I believe deeply that this was the healing uh, practice, the um, mm, that saved my life, really. My art saved my life at this time. So it was helped me gradually move through my grief. Um, it was a time, you know, in the early AIDS epidemic where people weren't, we were very, there's a lot of fear, and so there's a lot of isolation, too. So it was a dark time for myself and my family. But as I started journeying through this process and beginning the slow process of awakening, uh, I, I started questioning the meaning of life. What was my life for? You know, and this is what the beginning of the spiritual journey really is about. Um, the question of like, why am I here? What is my purpose? It did, what what 
my culture was telling me didn't really line up now because I had gone through this horrible, I was going through this horrible grieving period. So I think those were those early years that planted the seed for the work that I'm doing now. But it also uh, took about a decade before I would move into this new phase. So, but mostly during my 30s, I continued to do my art and do healing, activism work, working with um, doing AIDS education and outreach. I eventually started um, working with grieving children, um, doing um, uh, facilitation of that. So I was definitely on this journey of wanting to serve somehow and also using my art as a way to help others in their healing. So around the time I was 40, um, this painting too was one of the last paintings I did around my grief. Um, it was the dress that um, we just saw. It was this, my mother's wedding dress and that was um, her favorite flower was the gardenia and down below is our family home in New England. So this was really a memorial to my mother, uh, the memory of my mother. And so it was around, I was around 40 and I had another loss, relationship end, and it was then that this triggered this new intention to start um, following my heart, my soul calling, to create artwork um, and follow my um, path as an artist and a healer professionally and full time. Uh, and this also happened to correspond to the, the month before, like the few months before this, and then we had the 9-11 happen. So 9-11, we all know um, how painful that was for all beings around the planet. And we have a painting for this one too with the hands around the earth, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. This, um, and like I said, exactly the month before I just had this one big installation of my artwork and this intention to follow this soul calling and then 9-11 happened to the day one month later. And this also corresponded with the anniversary of my brother's death from AIDS. So um, it was significant for me on a personal level, and it was also just significant, just culture, this uh, deep place of grief that we were all feeling. And so on the day of remembrance that week, I went to uh, a ceremony at the Rose Quarter here in Portland, and um, it was really beautiful. There was spiritual teachers from all traditions, a priest, a rabbi, um, imam, uh, Native American elders. It was just this really outpouring of love. And it was so beautiful, and I think we all felt that. And we felt that I felt this sense of interconnectedness and oneness with all beings that I hadn't had never experienced. It was just this beautiful feeling of love. And so, excuse me, on my uh, way home on the Max train that night, I had a vision of this painting of the hands holding the earth. You can see the skyline at the bottom of nine, the um, New York skyline. Mm -hmm. And so, I was already in this place of um, moving into doing uh, workshops with women around grief too, grief using art as a healing process and whatnot. Uh, and then I was uh, discovered, invited to attend a workshop with Joanna Macy and the work that I did with Joanna Macy um, was the life-changing experience. That, of, that really set me at this next stage, this next threshold into the work that I'm doing. Because I went to a 10-day intensive with her, and we spent, it, she does despair and empowerment work. And so we spent four days in doing grief work and despair work in, in groups and do it ceremonially. It was just, it was really profound. And we went out after about four or five days into the forest uh, on a medicine walk. And it was there that I had a mystical experience. And during that mystical experience, I was I didn't know at the time what it was called, I, but I was sitting on a rock by a creek, my heart broken open from all this despair work. Oh, not only just not only planetarily, but personal grief. It was very profound witnessing. And so I'm sitting by this creek on this rock, and my whole sensory experience, my whole body was alive. And Everything seemed very sharp. I was drawing in my journal and a little bee landed on my pencil. And the butterflies were dancing above me and there were birds singing. It was just amazing, awesome experience. This mystical experience of oneness with all creation. 
that I was one. I love that story. When uh, when you tell that story of just the bee landing on your pencil, it's yeah. just so beautiful. It's such an amazing image. Yeah. So and thank you. And that was really, I mean, kind of that story leads up to those that experience. And at the end of the ten days, we took vows to serve the healing of the world. And I came home committed with that vision. And that was in 2002. I came home. I founded Sacred Art Studio. And um, I moved to a new location and converted a space to a studio. I have a space for workshops. And so then I've been, my work, my artwork has evolved over, the over time and been doing workshops and just in whatever way I can to get the, you know, the message out about you know, this beautiful planet that we live on and our interconnectedness in the web of life. And so I love that. That was um, a journey. So uh, how do you suggest then, um, like what are some of the steps that we can do to kind of go through this process a little faster? You know, if we want to make that connection um, through art to the environment, mm -hmm. you know, what, it, what is the process that, what do your mornings look like? What do you do? Yeah. Well, um, my mornings are pretty quiet. Um, I start with um, contemplative practices. Uh, I don't turn on any technology. Um, it's very quiet. I light candles in my studio and incense as an offering to the healing of the earth. Uh, I take time for um, what I call silent sitting. I, one of my teachers, Ajashanti, calls it um, instead of meditation, which can get really loaded with expectations and whatnot. He has this beautiful practice of just sitting silently and being present to all that is. And so I do that in the morning and then listen to uh, this time of year with the spring. I love to go outside and sit with the birds. And so I just kind of get grounded in the earth and have a very, or, and read maybe some inspirational, you know, poetry or literature or something like that. So if, if you're someone like me who, um, I do try to meditate in the morning, but is uh, really kind of addicted to the computers and phones and things like that, what are some steps that we can take um, to kind of create art like you? Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's important also to remember that we don't have to all create art the way I do. But, however... If you would like to integrate an art practice as a spiritual practice, I think the most important thing that anyone can do is just simply unplug for periods of time, whether that's in the morning or in the evening. Maybe you don't have time in the morning and you can come home from the evening and you don't turn on the evening news. Um, it's really, I think the first step really, if I promote anything really strongly in my work and in my message is the importance of taking time to unplug, even if it's short periods of time. 15 minutes a day. So to get grounded. Mm -hmm. Un unplug and connect. That's what it sounds like. Um, well, and to the natural world. I mean, I often in my workshops have people start out with um, contemplative practices to con connect you to the nature. So, uh, for instance, I have this beautiful nest that um, I found recently in my, my garden. Um, when I was cleaning, I hated to disrupt it, but I'd already pulled out the fern where it was living. But so this is a lovely practice. If um, no matter where you're living, uh, you'd be living in the city. Uh, we're all connected. Everything's connected to the earth. So it could be a piece of fruit. It could be a leaf. It could be a flower. It could be a stone. Anything from the natural world, and take some time to just sit with it and just observe it and uh, and appreciate the miracle of creation. So that's one practice to start with, just slowing down and just contemplating um, nature. Okay, so being present, appreciating the world around you. I like that. Uh, tell us, so you teach these workshops. Tell us about some of the um, techniques that you tell the students that they can, that they can use to um, use art a little bit more. Um, well, usually after we do some of these practices of slowing down and connecting with the earth, uh, one of the most simplest um, ways we, of creating a work of art, as something visually, is um, a collage. So collaging everything. If you could just take magazines, and it's just it's magazines and glue and scissors. And so um, it's an easy way, simple way to. Um, create a, some, a visual representation of all things that you love. 
in this particular case, um, I had created round um, shaped pieces of board to represent the earth. So that's a good place to start. Um, you could also do some, uh, take some crayons out and some doodling. Um, and, and there's, it doesn't have to even be visual. It can be also um, dancing, movement, writing, any form of expression that kind of takes you out of the head and brings you into the heart. So it doesn't have to be visual. It doesn't necessarily have to be a collage. That's just one place to start. It's anything that will help you appreciate the natural world mm -hmm. a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And bring in any creative practice. If you're if you're really paying um, close attention to the process in which you're engaged in, it brings you really into the present moment like nothing else. And so it really becomes art as meditation. And the art can be, uh, it could be cooking. Cooking is one of the most creative forms of expression I know of. Um, that's not my particular um, gift necessarily, but it is for many people. So I think if we slow down and give our attention to whatever it is we're creating. That in and of itself, I think, is beneficial to not only oneself, but contributes to our world. So that, um, I think that practice really helps you appreciate the natural world. But if you are kind of grieving or healing, um, what are some techniques that you can use uh, to kind of go through that process with art? Yeah. Well, it's very important. Um, it's similar practices, but I think what it is is uh, also stepping uh, slow when we're slowing down. When we do slow down to a place of being present with ourselves, it's not uncommon for our grief to come up and become more present. Because often in our busy, busy world, it's a way not to feel these deeper feelings. So if we think about what's happening on the planet, it, it is overwhelming. And so when we're slowing down, we're steeping ourselves in a creative process, and feel these feelings start to emerge. So I encourage if you can't, it would be not, if you can, it'd be great to do a practice with a friend um, or with a small group even, where there's some really deep listening with one another. And um, if you, if that's not available, just for oneself, is to really just allow ourselves to sink into the feelings that we're feeling of grief. And um, I think all the same practices that um, that we can do that honor our love and beauty of the natural world are also similar practices for transmuting our grief as well. Um, I know for myself personally, um, the act of painting really, it did save my life. It, so, and I don't say that lightly, I was very on a very destructive path there. And so I think that whatever expression that we're giving our attention to is healing in and of itself. Um, so that's one, a few ways to tap into those deeper feelings and express it through different same mediums. I mean, you could do a collage of all the things that grief that you feel grief around too. So, mm -hmm. yeah, you mentioned one technique, which is kind of uh, using the chalk and making like a mandala. Yeah, uh, is that? Can you explain that a little bit more? Sure, happy to. Um, this is a lovely, lovely practice that I do in groups as well. Um, I'm always amazed what what comes through. It's just so much beauty and heart. So these um, wonderful mandalas, um, and for those who don't know, a mandala um, is Sanskrit for the word circle. So it's really, um, and mandalas have been used throughout history as well for meditation and healing in many spiritual traditions. So, um, so in this practice, um, you it would be easy just to go to the art store and get some black paper and buy and some chalk. They're not expensive. Um, chalk is a great medium to work with because it's it's very um, um, forgiving and fun. You can really smudge the colors, and I like it because we get really messy. And messy is good. You know, so, <laughs> um, so in this practice, uh, what we we were tapping into our place of our hearts. So we, what I have have the participants do, and you can do this by yourself too. It's just basically sitting with yourself in quiet, in silence and tapping into what's alive in your heart, whether that's the beauty of our world or the deep grief that you're feeling around what's happening on the planet. So sitting with those deep emotions, and I know that can be hard, but that's where it's a practice. So it's taking some time to just honor you know, what, what, what you're feeling and 
letting go of the internal critic as well because I know we all have feeling that need, things need to be perfect but this is really just about the heart I call this the heart mandala and so sitting with the feelings and then just intuitively take a piece of chalk any any color that speaks to you and in the very center just create a little drawing of your heart and it doesn't need to be a heart necessarily it could just be a shape you know or a color I mean, it can be a little heart too as I have in one example here of mine but um, and then just kind of start spreading out color and shapes and whatever it is that just moves you without even thinking about it it's really just the act of putting down the color on the paper and I believe in the power of that um, to heal yeah, we have another one, too, that I think is really beautiful. It's either on this slide or the one before it. Uh, there it is. Yeah. I just love the colors. Mm -hmm. uh, just seeing color sometimes when you're grieving and, or you're sad mm -hmm. is a kind of a transformative experience. Yeah. I think the other piece, too, that um, I haven't mentioned is, the, um, is resiliency. I think the art, creating art for... Um, you know, is an important part of resiliency in the coming in as we're going through this time of transformation, because it is such a healing practice and healing and powerful spiritual practice. Um, I think it will help sustain us as we go forward. Yeah. So another piece I wanted to talk about because it really uh, encapsulates everything that you've been discussing, from the expression of love for the earth to the kind of coping with the healing and the loss emotions mm -hmm. is that beautiful triptych that's right behind you, the, the lover's triptych. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your inspiration for that and, and what's in that. Sure, yeah. Thank you, Robin. Um, it actually does enca uh, encapsulate pretty much everything that I've been speaking to today. Um, it was inspired originally by my grief uh, around what was happening in, during the Gulf oil spill. This piece, um, I was just, I was so bereft at what was happening. It was going on for a few months, and no one was really talking about it. And it, and finally, it became it came on the national radar, and I just felt very helpless to stop it. And so, as typical, I turned to my artwork as a form of, you know, giving expression to this feeling of pain and grief. And I had a vision when I was sitting in the garden, in the very center of the uh, center mandala is the tree of life. And in the very womb of the tree is a little embryo. And the embryo, to me, is symbolic that no matter what faith we choose or inherit, we're all of the earth. And so I started in the centerpiece. And there is a whole video on this, if you want to go to my website, too, um, that walks you through the symbolism of the, uh, the triptych. But it's a revisioning of the Garden of Eden story uh, through an earth-based uh, indigenous framework. So I just, um, yeah, the, the vision really was that I, f I felt that humanity had become so disconnected from their place in the web of life. And so I was thinking about this idea of, you know, how many of our spiritual traditions uh, see uh, Eden as a future time and place. But for me, Eden, paradise, is right here on this planet, right here, right now. And so how do we reclaim original blessing? And so the whole piece um, started you know, from the center, as I said, working with um, the medicine wheel, the four directions, the four elements, uh, the four creatures that are all endangered species as well. Um, and then you can see the kind of the serpent wrapping around the mandala as well. So all the elements of the garden story are there. And as I, I started working on the piece in the center, I realized Adam and Eve weren't going to fit in there. And so I decided to take the leap and added two wings on either side to represent the sacred feminine and the sacred masculine. And so it really was about transmuting my grief um, and giving expression to the beauty of our world through this painting. And... Um, yeah, and I love uh, the, a lot of my work comes out of researching the, um, our sacred texts of all traditions. So I found it really fascinating when I went back to the Genesis story, where the second creation story, where God blew uh, breath into Adam, 
out of the earth, Adama, which means red earth. So that felt very shamanic to me. So, so there are just a lot of pieces to, that inspired me to um, create this piece with the message that we are interconnected in the web of life and that the garden is right here, right now. Oh, I love that. And, and that piece is just so beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're just about out of time right now, but I wanted to give people the opportunity to ask some questions. Um, and I see there's a question. Uh, remember that you can chat in your questions if, if you have them. There's a question. The red earth is the clay that God used for Adam, yes? Is that correct? Well, in Hebrew, the word for uh, uh, for man is Adam, and the word for red earth is Adama. So I just make the connection between Adam and Adama. I, from, so Adama is um, red earth. Mm -hmm. yeah. Does that answer uh, your question? We have another one that says, also, what does the Hebrew text on the triptych mean? Mm. Thanks for asking that, yes. Um, that translates as in the beginning. The first few, few first few words of the Torah, the Old Testament. I mean, I like that um, that connection between you know Adam and the Earth because it just really again shows the oneness of everything, the oneness between humans and nature around us. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this piece, um, this piece has evolved to include uh, the video. That if you go to my website, you'll see that. Also, a larger installation called Return to the Garden which is um, an installation with an interactive uh, nature mandala that people co-create. There's a morning wall and there's a beauty wall and so it's a place where people can tap into what they're feeling and uh, break open our hearts to the beauty of our world and allow space for our feelings of despair as well. Uh, and it's a, I, it's a morning wall I think with a U as mm -hmm. in sadness. For grieving, yes, mm-hmm, yes. Um, and just, just to let you know, Amy's website is www.sacredartstudios.net. So you can look at some more of her paintings there and um, check out her videos, which are really, really amazing. I mean, just to see more of her explanation behind these things is pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, so let's see, does anyone have any other questions? Uh, I would say... I would add to the um, beginning, going back to our original question, what is the role of art in a changing world? For me, I believe that art has the power to break open our hearts and from there inspire action on behalf of our Earth, our beloved planet, and all our creatures and all beings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, connect our heart to everything. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, this is great. Thank you so much, Amy, for, for explaining this all to us today. It's just been really, really nice. Well, it's been fun. Thanks for inviting me. Mm -hmm. All right, so you can check out this video on EdenKeeper.org. Um, Amy's website, once again, is SacredArtStudios.net. It will also be available on Facebook and uh, Google+, Plus. so please check us out there, and stay tuned for future webinars. Thanks again. Bye. Bye. <laughs>